I, I'd like to make some uh, correction on the um, assignment uh, that has just been uploaded to you. Uh, thanks for the correction made by a student. Now, uh, the correct judgment should be The case of Ng Yim Fong Loretta, this is correct, but the action number is not. Now, um, please write down. Um, the correct citation for the judgment for the purpose of the assignment is neutral citation 2021 HKCFI 1787 I repeat neutral citation 2021, that is this year, HKCFI, meaning Hong Kong Court of First Instance, judgment number 1787. 1787. Now, the action number should in fact be HCA 635 of 2019. I repeat, it's XCA 635 2019 and the judgment date should be June 22nd 2021 okay. Now, uh, please download this judgment and the question in the assignment is correct. The question in the assignment is correct in case you, you've got the question. But the judgment is not. Okay, let me repeat again. Now you go to Citation, neutral citation, 2021, this year, decision by the court of first instance, and the correct number is 1787. Um, neutral citation section. find a paragraph four there, the, the Chinese will, 
together with the English translation. So this is this is the um, correct judgment. So please download it and follow the questions, the three questions in the assignment, and do it. This is a very interesting assignment. And as you can see, the wheel is a wheel in Chinese. And so you also have the opportunity to read the English translation against that background if you try to understand rule 19 it will be quite useful for our present module and we will spend the second half of lecture 10 in order to discuss the assignment so that I shall spend half of the lecture to go through with you some of the essential features in this uh, particular adju uh, judgment so that you should be able to understand the gist of the judgment and also be in a position to tackle the three questions that we ask in the assignment. Any problem? Yes? Say that again. Yes. I'll do it like this. This is the citation. See that? 2021 HKCFI 1787. And the action number on top, as you can see, is HCA. 635 of 2019. In so far as the plaintiff is concerned, it's already written there. Got it? I'll do it again, how you can get it from the Judiciary Online. Let's do it again. Type HK Judiciary. Then you will see this page. Go down a little bit. See where it reads Hong Kong Judiciary Judgment. Click it in, type judgments, then advanced search, this is advanced search, that will take you here. The first line, click the downward arrow sign, then you will see various choices. The fourth line from top, you can see neutral citation, which is this one. All right, let's 
Wi-Fi up to here. Are you able to get here in your own iPhone? Get it? It is essential that you should reach this uh, place before you can actually get the judgment. So here is a judgment in this year. So it's 2021. This is called neutral citation. 2021 meaning a judgment this year. And it's a judgment given by the court of first instance. HKCFI. And the number, okay, can anyone repeat the number? The judgment number? Thank you. Is one seven, thank you, eight seven. This is the neutral citation of the judgment number. Then click it in. You see three judgments. The reason why there are three judgments because there are in fact various action numbers all consolidated into one hearing. So therefore, for that one hearing on the same day of the three consolidated actions, there is only one judgment. So whichever you take is the same. So here, you see, so I click in here, XCA 635 of 2019. This is where you, where you should find the judgment. As you can see, the three judgments, so there are three citations, but then only one citation of the judgment. So 1787, so this year's judgment. about paragraph 4 of the judgment that should enable you to get a glimpse of the will see what the contents would be and then go on with the rest as I said I shall discuss with the class again at the 10th lecture at the second half on this particular assignment in order to enable you to handle the assignment more comfortably. Any problem? Okay, thank you very much. Informal will, homemade will, sometimes is missing. So you appoint a person, in this example, you appoint two persons. Now the law allows any number of executors named in the will. But when it comes to grant to be issued, the maximum number at any one time is four. Maximum is four. 
So as I said, in an appointment like this, you appoint two persons using the wordings here. So you appoint two persons in the will. By the time when a grant is needed in respect of the will, so usually three options. One, A applies. Two, B applies. Three, A and B applies together. All right? Before we break last time, I told the class that um, use these simple wordings. Do not use the words jointly or severally, or jointly and or severally, or jointly and severally. These are confusing words which has caused problem. So the best bet is leave it as it is. Use this kind of simple wordings that will do. Um, what we see now is a more complicated appointment clause. This is appointment of guardian. So with this slide, you see here the reason for such appointment is on appointment of guardian. It is where one considers there is a possibility of what we call minority interest is the line below purpose where minority interest is likely. Minority interest means some beneficiaries under the will is under the age of majority. This, however, whether or not there is minority interest is counted only at the date of death, usually. In fact, in fact, one way to avoid the minority interest problem is to defer the date of counting from the date of death to the date of grant application. So in other words, we are talking about three different dates or three possible different dates. One is the date of making of the will when the testator may have a child only one year old. Second is the date of death when at the time when the testator died, he is survived by his son aged 10 year old, for instance. So that is under 18 so we say minority interest arises as at the date of death. But this is not the most significant. So it takes us down to the third date, which is the date you apply to the probate registry for a grant. This is the date that is relevant.
to show you a form. We'll be looking at this over and over again. will be one of the form we'll visit again is where the application is by an executor. The only thing that I want to show you now in order to illustrate the minority interest is now this is an application for grant by a named executor. I scroll down. You see, in the entire form, there is no reference to minority interest. In other words, whether or not there are beneficiaries under the will is under the age of 18. This is immaterial for the purpose of the grant. This is a case where one executor applied for a grant, and the point I'm trying to show you is, when the application is made by an executor, minority interest, as well as another term which we'll know in due course called life interest, is immaterial. It does not affect on the requirement on the number of applicants. Then I show you another form in order to alert you on the differences. This is interstate. This is where the disease died without a will. I like to draw your attention to clause number nine and clause number ten, where you'll find the reference to minority interest and life interest. So in other words, when someone died without a will, one will have to be extremely careful and have to declare whether minority interest arises under the intestacy, or alternatively, no minority interest arises under the intestacy. So it's a matter of pick and choose. But one will have to make a choice. So that shows the importance of minority interest. In our whole module, the law emphasis on the need to protect minority interest. Um, towards the end of this lecture, if we have enough time to talk about this, you will understand this particular creature or creation by the law in order to deal with this potential problem. 
when minority interest or life interest arises. So we need extra precaution, and I'll tell you why later on. So you can see there is a need when the applicant is not an executor. So we have to have some extra precaution. At this juncture, just remember there is a need to appoint a second administrator, okay, where the applicant is not an executor. That takes us back to this PowerPoint. Now, we are talking about the drafting of a will. So, here because this is something to be written for and on behalf of the testator, and again is to afford more protection in terms of protection, protecting the interest which may arise or the problem which may arise when minority interest should arise. So in making a will, the testator is in a position to make this extra precaution. This is usually done by way of an additional appointment clause, is the appointment of guardian or guardians. Usually it's one or two. And look at this. I appoint A and B as the executors and trustees and the guardians of my minor children. So here, this is one clause that appoints three capacities, one executor, two trustee, three guardian. This is another option. Instead, you can pick this. I appoint Mr. C to be the guardian after the death of my wife of any of my children who are then minors such guardian to act jointly with any guardian appointed by my wife. Now, at this juncture, please remember that the law in Hong Kong is not entirely the same with the law in England. Here in Hong Kong, the natural parents In particular, the mother is a natural guardian. So even if there is no appointment, no appointment out of a better marriage, both parents, then they will be natural guardian. There is no need to apply to the court. So you can see the wordings in this clause is a little bit peculiar. It tries to deal with a situation after the death of the natural guardian, meaning the natural mother of the child. So in other words, as long, let's, let's say this is a testator, the father. Father married the mother and they have a child, two-year-old. So the father makes a will. The father said, okay, now, I, I appoint my brother and my sister as the executors, and then I appoint, let's say, my grandfather as the guardian, not on my death, but on my death, but after the death of my wife. 
So after the death of the wife, and if, if, the, if the child is still a minor, that means there is no more natural guardian. So there is, in principle, a vacuum, in that there is no lawful guardian to protect the interests of the child. So here, you appoint the grandfather, C, as any of my children. Okay, now it's one year old, two year old. That if when I die, when I die, would be, let's say, 18, 17, 16, we don't know. But anyway, would be in case on my death, some minors. It does not invoke on this clause, but only when subsequently my wife also passed away, then if there is one child of mine under the age of 18, still 17, still 17 meaning still a minor, then after my the death of my wife, then my grandfather will be the guardian appointed by me under this will, and my grandfather C will have the capacity as what we call a testamentary guardian. Testamentary, something to do with the property on death. Here in this case, my death. Then, the additional provisions here to act jointly with any guardians appointed by my wife. So this clause in a way, provides for certain vacuum being filled with. So it's just like a precaution. Okay? Sometimes we may do some variation. The variation is in a sense like to act also with my wife. So if that is the case, then will be you delete the death of my wife. So the law will enable there is one grandfather being a testamentary guardian, and then the mother being the natural guardian. Both of them will have the authority to protect the interests of the minor child. So it's a double precaution, but sometimes there may be problems, particularly in modern times, when the concept of marriage changes very rapidly, particularly when one spouse passes away. That will give rise to a lot of new marriage, new family, and then we'll have all kinds of step relationships. That is where the problem will occur. The second husband of the wife, will he be protecting the interests of the stepchild out of the first marriage of his, of his wife? Maybe, maybe not. So if that is the case, it will be helpful to insert a guardian appointment clause here. All right? Now we have the receipt clause. This is a general receipt clause, real and personal. We briefly mentioned it. Whatsoever and wheresoever. So what it means, this clumsy wordings, just mean all my assets worldwide. Okay, all my assets worldwide, anywhere, whether in my name or in the name of somebody else, whether it is in Hong Kong, Macau, or in the mainland, or in North America, it does not matter. One will deal with them all. It is usual, very usual, that we will provide 
a power to postpone sale. So in other words, the executives are being permitted to extend or delay the sale of any property. This will enable the executor to defer the sale. But we have to be very careful. Although there is a power given in a will, generally given under the will like this, it is not advisable for the testator to enable the executor to postpone or defer the sale of property indefinitely. There is a duty on the part of the executor to proceed expeditiously on collection of assets, turn them into money, and ready for distribution. <coughs> Generally, the law is this. Any administration of a state must be done properly. If you have decided to delay the sale of the property, the property unreasonably, and then cause loss to the property or to the estate, then beneficiaries may sue, may sue the executor. Even though you have a clauses of this nature, because the court will look at such delay on sale is or is not reasonable. Now, it is still quite often in Hong Kong these days where in a simple family, father makes a will, give it to the mother, and the kids equally. And then the, the mother, well, for various reasons, she has decided not to sell the matrimonial home for decades. Not for a few months, but for decades. Then the delay for 10 or 20 years, unless we can repeat what we have experienced in the past few decades, where land will continue to grow and increase in price. The more delay, the higher the price. That, of course, is excellent. But if there are economic downturns, or this financial crisis, certainly the property falls considerably, then the executor will be held personally liable for the loss. Surprisingly, we have quite a few cases reported of disputes in this nation. And it's usually when there is a step relationship going or existing within the family. Child of the first marriage is built with the wife of the second marriage for reason, no sale of property, and then they sue for drop of the property value, they sue for no rental being paid, so on and so forth. So the thing to remember here this is a general provision. We usually incorporate them all. But when it comes to administration of a state, uh, we need to advise the executor to act prudently. And then, now this clause will show the meaning of the residual estate. So you sell all the assets and then you have converted them into cash by way of sale, let the property then turn into money, the net sale proceed that is being used to pay the various liabilities, the debts, the expenses, 
and the other liabilities. All this will give rise to the residual estate in a testic situation. Then it says, subject there to, to my wife, absolutely. Now here, we have to be very careful on the wordings because I have wanted you about the difference in the definition of the term residual estate. On the one hand, we have the interstate. On the other hand, we have the testate. Now, here, this is a clause in the will, so it is a testate situation. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Having collected all the assets, having sold the assets, then pay off all the debts and liabilities. Does it mean that this is a residual estate? You have two choices, yes or no. Think about it now. Yes or no. If yes, why? If no, why? All right, any volunteer? The question is on the term residual estate here in a state situation. Please explain to me. Anyone? in another way. Is the provisions here on this slide having the same meaning as residual estate on an interstate situation? Options? Yes or no? that you are seeing now the same as residual estate on interstate situation. you got 100 mark or you got zero. No? Not the same. Not the same. Okay, second question. Why? Sorry? Postpone sale? Uh, no. Anyone?
there are non residual gifts? Is it on intestate or here? Is it on intestate situation? No will? Or here, there is a will? You mean here? Only here in will in a testate situation. That's correct. So number one, wake up. What we see here is very similar to a testate situation. And it's very confusing. It is very confusing because all these precedents in will clause are very clumsy. They are so clumsy that sometimes you may not realize the differences. And the point that I'm trying to drive at is that do not amend those clauses, the wording said, unless you are very sure of the effect. Okay? Now, this is what it shows. Here, I want you to look at line number two from top. Give up the payment of tax, debt, as well as after payment of any non receiver gifts. What is most important that I like to draw your attention is these two lines. In a complete receiver as they cost, it is usual to add or include the wordings. after payment of any non residual gift. As just suggested, it is very important. And now, we are talking about rule drafting now, so I'm trying to ask you to pay attention not to cross out those unnecessary wordings in order to avoid this possible mistake. Otherwise, we may run into problem. This particular precedent which I picked is one type of precedent. So usually it ends up like this. In this paragraph two, in order to give the receiver a state beneficiary. So in this case, the wife. But in fact, in the beginning field lines, it always started with the payment of non receiving gifts. So that's why I wanted to draw your attention to. But here, since we are only talking about receiving costs, so I just include this in order to show you what they are. But the emphasis, as I've told you, always re remember that it is subject to payment of non receiving gifts. Otherwise, there will be no difference. Of course, of course, you should argue, well, there is no law that requires when a person dies with the will that he needs to make any non residual gift clause. Remember the first example that last seen on the universal, universal legacy? I give everything to my wife and I appoint her the sole executive. So this is the holy gift of all the receiving gift without any non receiving gift. Alright? This is the testimonium clause. Testimonium clause has a difficult name. But the meaning is easy. What it means that this is the end of the will. Meaning all the testamentary dispositions 
all the appointment of executor, etc., have been completed. And it tells the world that this is the end of the testamentary disposition that I make under this my will. Usually begins with the two words in witness. In witness. Sometimes it comes with the date, sometimes it does not. It depends on the kind of precedent that you pick. Then in a will, after the testimonial clause, you go on to provide additional wordings in order to satisfy the other parts of a valid will being evidence to show the testamentary intentions. Of course, this is the attestation clause. We should remember a will is to be signed by three persons, at least one testator, two and three, two attesting witnesses, or two or more attesting witnesses. So, this is signed by the above named the testator in our presence and by us in his. So you can see the wording shows that testator signed in front of two or more witnesses and then by us, meaning by the two, two of us in the presence of the testator. This is only one example. Then we have the interpretation clause. Now, attestation clause is the finish on the formality requirement, the number three element, which is attestation. Whereas interpretation clause is just to show that there is knowledge and approval that shows the essential elements on testamentary intention. You know the contents of the will. So, the contents, if not in the same language, is being explained and put it in different dialects or different languages so that the testator who signed in a different language will be taken to understand or to have understood the meaning of the will. So, by looking at this example, you will see how we divide them, the various clauses, in and to form a simple standard will. It is my suggestion to you <coughs> that this will form a fairly standard and good skeleton to make a will. It has the benefit of enabling you to expand on each particular section as may require. We start off, look at the uh, left hand corner column. You have the commencement clause, the revocation clause, executive appointment clause. Then there is two other clauses which are the non receivable gift clause. The specific gift, my Rolex watch, the pecuniary gift, the general gift, $100,000. Both of them are non receivable gift. And I give all the rest of my property. So in this example, you see how the receivable estate are being written and defined. I give all the rest of my property. And in this particular example, clause 5 
is worded in such a way that the gift of the receiver estate is conditional on an extended survival clause of 20 days. So this is an example which extended the doctrine of left that we mentioned before, namely beneficiary who died before the testator do not take the gift and here this restriction is extended to the effect that even if the wife shall survive the testator but if the testator well day one he died and then day two the receiver beneficiary died the difference between day one and day two is shorter than 28 days then this extended doctrine of left shall apply meaning the receiver beneficiary shall not take he's alive but died let's say 27 days after still the receiver beneficiary will not take the benefit under this will. Uh, this clause, this space is not that useful in Hong Kong, but before we abolish the estate duty, it was very useful because it, it saves inheritance for two times so that you pay two times as the duty so die shortly to or before then no need to pay as the duty on the second death also also this may be of some significance for those beneficiaries residing in North America when they have gift tax. So if there is a Hong Kong testator giving every gift to his son who is a US citizen and then the receiver estate to the grandchildren. So if they die, I mean the testator and the son die within 20 days of each other, that means there will be two occasions when one will have to give the gift tax. So this is an other tax burden, and particularly in the US when the tax is huge. So this is one way you can try to provide in order to cater for any possible tax benefit. Number six is the testimonial clause. Then the attestation clause. Then we have the interpretation clause. So as I said, you can then make changes here and there, particularly if you have the need to expand on the non receiver gift, or you can amend the receiver gift clause. Now here, again, on the receiver gift clause number five there, you see, if the wife does not take, my executor shall give all my property to such charity or charities as he thinks fit. Now, in our subject, there is a term called power of appointment P 
P-O-W-E-R of O-F appointment A-P-P-O-I-N-T M-E-N-T Power of appointment The meaning of power of appointment is the authority to make anyone as a beneficiary. So here in this will, the testator gives the authority to the to the executor. The authority says, "All right, if certain conditions happen or certain events should happen, then I give the right, I give the authority, I give the power to my executor to choose." Anyone to become a beneficiary of my assets. This is called power of appointment. And in clause five here, the last part, this is called a special power of appointment. The term special means restricted. Restricted. R E S T R I C T E D or qualified. Meaning the choice of beneficiaries are limited. And the scope stated here is the possible beneficiary should only be charity. Or in fact, one or more charities. So this is a good way. So this one, clause five, it serves three purposes. Number one, receive your gift. Number two, a deferred doctrine of left. Number three, a special power of appointment. So all this, all this. Are examples that you can pick and choose in this simple way. This is an example of any lesson to be learned in preparation of wills. In recent years, even in Hong Kong, we have a growing tendency of people suing their lawyers for negligence of the lawyer. And White and Jones is an English case that reflects how serious the implication would be. The lesson to be learned is the delay in grant application to make a grant is not as serious as a possible delay in preparing a will. Now there is a dichotomy. On the one hand. The court of Hong Kong emphasized that we must not arrange a will to be signed half-heartedly. We must ensure that his intention and his instruction are being understood carefully. He should be in the right mind. Not under undue influence, he has thought about his own assets, thought about people likely to be his beneficiaries. Then make a will, meaning not in a rush. On the other hand, the law also penalized for the delay. So we just sit there for a while. And make sure that while is not too long a while. Look at this. 
Why Dan Jones is too harsh? It's very harsh. July 17, instruction received. One month later, <coughs> internal instruction for wheel preparation. This is a bit lengthy. It can be shortened. Two months later, from instruction, appointment to visit T, the testator on wheel. Okay, remember, well, this is overseas, not in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, you take the MTR and go to my office, 30 minutes, all right? But in England, you may have to travel. And particularly if you're old and without, you know, your family members to assist you. You live in the village side, the countryside, and you go to the town center to see the solicitor, that may take you about two to three hours. Very inconvenient. So all this, okay, I write a letter. Well, I have prepared your will. Would you please uh, see if this is what you want? Appointment to visit on will. I'll take instruction. I drafted the will. I want to show you whether this is in accordance with the instruction you've given me. Two months. Hey, Mr. T, the will is prepared. Uh, please come to my office and sign the will. And the solicitor didn't know that his client died three days before. So it is all within a matter of two months. Three days. And then, the beneficiaries in the will, the beneficiaries in the unsigned will, or the beneficiary in the intended will, never completed, sue the solicitor for damages. And the court ruled in favor of the beneficiaries. Two lessons to be learned. Number one, just like eating ice cream. Once you buy it, you eat it. Don't wait for two months, it will melt. So to make a will, make sure you take about, let's say, one to two weeks to get to get the instruction, get it prepared. And then let's say in two or three weeks time, ask your client to come in. Make sure you, you write to him, are you going to die now or soon? Then you come to my office. There is no hard and fast rule. Particularly you know that Mr. Wong is dying. He wants to make a will. And then you wait until after Christmas. Well, you will, the beneficiaries, we would like you to see you in court. So for you guys, this is a particular serious lesson. At this juncture, I tell you, you will not appreciate it. After you graduate, holding out as an expert in probate, which must include will drafting, and then you wait for two months, after you get your annual leave or after your marriage, and you come back, you got fired. So it's a very serious matter. If you have other cases to do, well, the others can sit for a while. Whenever it comes to the making of will, number one, use the six skeleton which I've just illustrated to you to expand on it. And then make sure you get it done fast. Of course. We want to make sure that there is no undue influence or you know, instruction coming from the major beneficiaries. Always insist to get instruction or confirmation of instruction from the, the testator. Well, you see, your clients usually will be your friends, your buddies. This will make your case worse. 
Your buddy will say, oh, my dad is dying. Well, he said he wants to make a will and give 90% of the asset to me. And then give 10% of my brother who is now living in Australia. Ah, it should ring a bell. This is a typical example that it is the major beneficiary who would like to ensure a will to be written as said to be intended by the testator when it is not. We got lots of situations like this. We have overseas siblings who have never returned to Hong Kong. And then we have one or two minor beneficiary or one or two of those girlfriend from across the border taking the old man to make a will and then you make a will like this okay now 2000 now. for 2000 you will learn a very huge lesson so remember not too quick not too fast and not too slow and not too cheap because you make mistakes at a price you will not be able to get legal opinion from Mr. Wong asking your teacher to save your day when it's too late. All right? So if you are not in a position to assist, say no. One thing that I have to ask you guys, if the need comes, okay, even a simple mistake, you make mistake and you regret for the rest of your life. But if you can be sure that, ah, oh, right, it looks rational, the will is okay, the old man, give it to the, um, to the wife, all right. One and the same person as the sole beneficiary and sole executive, okay. The more you talk to him, the more family members you know about, then the more caution you should be. Got it? <coughs> This is what it says about the will procedure. You take you take instruction and then confirm by testator. You prepare the will, send the will for review, and then ask the testator to come to approve the draft will, appointment to come again to sign. Para 5 and para 6 appears to be redundant because usually you come to you ask the client to come to your office and sign. You don't ask him to come to see you twice. You want to get more legal fee? You are a crook, okay? They don't appreciate, ah, I want you to come here for caution. I want to make sure that you're in your right mind. They don't think about like this. You're causing, you're taking my money and you're also taking my time. So what you have is complaint. But as a prudent will preparer, it is said that this is prudent. So at least we should try to find the opportunity to make sure that there is this approval, amendment, and approval being done in a way that the testator has got the opportunity. Now these days, one of the things to be done is to get it done through, well, you can do it either by way of email or by WhatsApp. So as long as you got something feedback, even from a text message from WhatsApp, then you say, oh, I understand it, okay? Or in Chinese, no problem. Because it shows that the, the testator has given the chance to think about the draft and able to show you, is this or is this not all his instruction? Also, there are circumstances that the testator would change his mind all the time. Initially, he said, I'll give everything to, the wife, to, to, to my wife. Lah. And then second job, he said, well, I have a second thought. Uh, give, give something to my mom. Lah. And then after being, you know, having a quarrel uh, by the wife, Mr. Wong, I changed my mind. I give no nothing to my mom. Lah. All the way to and fro. So all this, you see, you are not, you are not supposed to, to teach your client a lesson. You know, he is the boss. You are not. You are just a servant. So what you do in situations like this is try to defer the execution a little bit later so that he has a chance and the opportunity to cool down. And then make sure when he comes next time, well, ask his wife to, to go somewhere else. 
so that you can talk to him silently and coolly. Don't you want to die without giving anything to your mom, you know? Do you really like your, uh, love your wife so much? So all these are kind of instructions in order to show one important thing, testamentary intention. So you go on, sign it, usually you read it, ask the testator to read it himself as well, two witnesses to sign, and testator to sign before the witnesses, two witnesses sign to attest before testator. Now paragraph 12, that is important, something always remember particularly when instruction comes from the major beneficiary. In the example, okay, one child lived with the testator in Hong Kong, where the testator give him 90%, and then the other child lived outside Hong Kong, okay, receive only 10%. There is always the attack of lack of testamentary intention. One thing closely connected with paragraph 12 is an allegation on this lack of intention, lack of knowledge and approval. Because when you make a will, you don't give it to the major beneficiary. Even though he comes in with the old man to sign it, Make sure that the original will is signed and received by the old man. He received the will, the left hand, and then by his right hand he passed on to his son. That is his business. Don't say, well, I have never given the original will to the old man. Yeah, I give it to the 90% beneficiary who gave instruction, who witnessed the will, and then he will, who received the original will. And then the old man will be order to say, I don't remember I have made a will. Nobody explained the contents of the will to me. And I have received, I've never received any of the will, whether original copy or photocopy. So these are basic techniques that you must employ to protect yourself. Make sure that he signs something to say the original. And now that you guys have the handphone, okay, you have your iPhone, then you make sure that you can take a photograph. You don't need, you don't need to be a, a legal executive, right? Take your iPhone, and then, okay, he makes a will. Every time I do it, okay, this is the will. This is the old man, 90 year old. So I make sure, okay, hold the will, and then take a picture. My secretary will take a picture with the man, my boss, and myself. I give him the original will. So it doesn't lie in his mouth or in the 10% minor beneficiary to say that, well, my dad died, he never made any will, he never received the original will. Then my trump card, look at this man, this is a photograph, is it your dad? So these are stuff that you will need to try to learn how to protect yourself. All this happened easily and all this litigation can be avoided. So this is how uh, we, as a professional legal executive, learn how to protect your firm and yourself. Remember, your boss never remember. Your boss only signed the name, and off he go. And you are, you are there to finish the rest of the whole business. Court of Appeal in Hong Kong, in the out case, what should you do? Receive instruction. Draw up the draft will. Met the state personally. Take or confirm your instruction. Now here, four, five, and six are the additional items which I want my students to remember. 
make it as your standard questionnaire. When you take instruction from the testator, make sure you add items four, five, and six. This is to supplement the banks and good fellow tests on testamentary capacity. Here you should ask, well, have you made any will before? And then, can you tell me the difference between the old will and the new will? And last, you, you know the difference between the old will and the new will. You know that some of the beneficiary in the work and the old will are being disinherited. Yeah, 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 confirm. Then you proceed to engross the new will. Sometimes it's difficult. I find this hard. Uh, difficult in a sense, the client comes to you, well, 10 or 20 years ago, I made the old will, but I don't know where they are now. Well, you find, I find it very difficult to ask your, your, your client to go back, you know, particularly he has moved several times. Look at your old will. Get a copy to me, get a copy of the old will to me so that I can show you the differences. If you don't, if you don't show me the old will, I'm not going to make the new will. Very difficult to say. So, it's up to you for your own protection in your questionnaire to ask your client to confirm whether he has or has not made any old will. Of course, you may say, yeah, I, I made a will um, 10 years ago, but I've lost it. You've lost it, right? Do you remember the contents? No, I don't. Okay? He has made a will 10 or years before, forgot about the contents. What can you do? Particularly a man like me, you know, always forgetting things. You know, when you get old and old and old, you don't remember what happened 10 or 20 years ago. It's not my fault. It's not it's not it's not a fault of myself being getting old. I don't want to get old. I have made a will ten years ago, I've lost it, so so what? I've lost it, so I come to you to make a new will, Mr. Wong, you make a fuss. In your questionnaire, you ask a client, all oh, right, you, you, you make a will over ten years ago, huh? Long time ago. Yeah, 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 long time ago. When? Over ten years. Remember the content? No, don't remember the content. No, what you have instruction. Then you proceed and get the instruction. Oh, now you want to keep everything to Mr. Wong, okay? Oh, thank you very much. So whatever the client has in mind, write down. These days it's quite usual to give all kinds of charities. Make sure, don't give everything to the charities unless you are absolutely sure that this is the intention of the testator. Otherwise, it's much better to divide it into different a number of parts in the residual estate. All right, ten parts, for example. How many kids do you have? I got one wife and I got two kids. Okay, one one part to your wife, one part to your kid, one part to your second kid, and the seven part out of the ten. I give it to the um, Hong Kong anti cancer Society. Yes, okay, no problem. Why? Because they've been so nice, you know? They know that I am stage four, and they still save my day for so long. The nurses are so good, the doctors are beautiful. Okay, so I, I think more people should, should be afforded this opportunity, right? They become a better man. When they, when they stay in the hospital, when they live at home, they live like a slave. You know, Hong Kong is so so narrow, uh, so smaller, uh, and then the, the kids, the family members. Family members are always, always very cruel, you know, to the, to the old patient, you know. When you when you always complain, uh, you lost your memory, uh, and you not urinate properly, uh, and you cannot take the shower yourself, uh, how, how long can your wife, you know, stand you? No way, you can die sooner. Oh, no, go to age of home, go to this society. You know, all this hospital. So this is very popular these days to give charity. So give some shares to the charity, okay, no problem. 
So this is how you should manage your will like this. There is one thing that is troublesome, that may be troublesome on testamentary capacity. Particular old man. So sometimes, sometimes you would invite the testator on the day he comes to your office to visit the family doctor first. And the family doctor will say, Oh, I have examined the, uh, the old man. He has been my patient for the last 10 years. And uh, I have examined the, him. And I find him um, sound mind and is capable of making a will or signing legal document. There is no hard and fast rule, but the preferred practice <coughs> is to ensure some medical examination records are being obtained. The best is to get it from the family doctor. Family doctor is easy, much easier. When you go to a public hospital, I don't think they are ready to, to give a letter like this. Because you, you only pay for your stay, you know, you don't pay for the examination. And it's always very troublesome, particularly when the old man dies soon. The preferred practice, the preferred practice, uh, which you can do, prepare a will, not too complicated, Go to the family doctor's clinic. Let him be examined by the family doctor for 15 minutes. And the family doctor says, yes, I think he's fit. Okay, give me a two-line letter. And then, for the will to be signed before the doctor and your boss. If your boss is not willing to do it, you guys can do it. There is no rule that says you must need a solicitor to be present. And the modern trend is when the court wants formal will to be done, they mean through a firm. So by this time, you guys are properly trained and you got all this training, so they would uh, respect you guys as good as a lawyer. So this is something, there's no law that uh, you cannot witness it particularly when we know people can make their own will and when will can be signed without a witness. So you are independent party, you guys are well qualified, take proper instruction, the will is simple enough, uh, witnessed by a American practitioner, second witness by you, this is perfect. And this is the way how to, to, to do it and also the slang that we use is how to pass the buck. There is a burden you always have to prove on testamentary capacity, on testamentary intentions. So all this, you can leave it to the medical practitioner. So plus the questionnaire that you prepare, plus a simple will, plus you are qualified, then this is good enough. Everything signed, give the will to the testator and off you go. Uh, this is the this is the uh, part of the judgment quoted from the court of appeal that I mentioned to you. It's a judgment in 2020, and this case is an old case that has aroused a lot of uncertainty among practitioners, so that they are reluctant to to prepare will. So the court Jung judge of the court of appeal, that that is um, Mr. Pierre Jung. Well. Then he say, ah, oh, I urge it special attention so that you know people prepare the will. They must do it properly in the preparation and in the execution. They place a very heavy emphasis on the role and the practice of lawyers, okay? In the same judgment, another court of appeal judge, Judge Huang, choosing one, paragraph 75, she said, oh, I certainly agree with what is said by uh, Judge Peter Joe, 
and then proper inquiry should be conducted by a solicitor in this situation. This situation means a testator who is sick and old or infirmed. Okay, that's what they say. So they say, well, you have to be very careful and, 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 and do all this. So in this, in this case, this is the first of the three court of appeal judgments. This is the first in uh, 2020. And then two other that follows. Eventually, in the third court of appeal judge, uh, the court of appeal softened the tone. Softened the tone. Um, they say, uh, we now take a holistic approach. Holistic means the court will look at everything around. Everything is relevant when it comes to the making of work. Whether there is testamentary capacity, three things. Whether there is testamentary intentions, knowledge and approval. We look at it all around. How long have been the men been married? What happened to the family members who are good and who are no good? And then the extent of the property and the kind of uh, extramarital relationship and the respect of the family members. All of this, these days, after the three court of appeal judgment on the holistic approach, the court here in Hong Kong is now prepared to give a more humanitarian tone. Before, we say that everything has to be very straight. And also, they rely so much on the medical practitioner in order to see that, oh, this is a man who has got the right capacity. And now the modern trend is medical practitioner is not the only thing. Medical practitioner is not necessarily the most important evidence for a few years we have been depending on what we call the psychiatrist. Psychiatrist is some kind of medical doctors uh, who specialize in mental area, psychiatrist. And then recently the court is prepared to say, well, we have to look at it all around. Also, we are prepared to accept evidence which is in conflict with the medical evidence. That means today, if you have a doctor who said, no, look, Mr. Wong is of um, the testamentary capacity to sign a will. And then the other unhappy beneficiary can say, look, all these acts by the testator shows that he has not got the chance to look at everything in an objective manner. He has been under undue influence, under duress, and all this. So the court is now prepared to look at it as a layman and look at it on what we call the armchair principle. The court will try to look at it from the point of view of the testator. Look at what he has been done, what he has been exposed to, and then come to a view to see whether the will that he made is or is not a valid one. So, to put it very simply, the flexibility is much better now. <coughs> okay, I'll give you a break in two minutes. Now, during the break, uh, you, you are invited to look at this will. This is, <coughs> this is the will which has been subject to a lot of fight in the High Court and in the Court of Appeal. It's a very funny will to the extent that it's a combined wordings that on one hand reflects on the mind of an average testator in Hong Kong. One thing, you know, they want to uh, talk about how how important, how, how, how uneasy they are able to establish, you know, uh, the kind of uh, success they have attained in Hong Kong and then they want it to continue and then they want somebody to be being looked after and then they want somebody else to look after the family business you know in a way that they think is appropriate all this has created all kinds of problems 
all kinds of problems. This, in my opinion, is a lousy will. Although it is something in Chinese, uh, although you can imagine it, but from the point of making a bad will, this should not be followed at all. A will is to make testamentary disposition. If you want to appoint the executive, you appoint the executive. Don't, don't appoint this. Well, I would say it's funny, but they are more am ambitious. And then talk about how, how things is to be developed in the, in the company. The other thing which is I like to draw your attention to this is a, a very funny way on charity. On charity. In this rule you can see in paragraph three, in paragraph two, paragraph one, paragraph two, and paragraph three, paragraph four, they talk about this charitable company. See this? The name is Charitable Foundation. See that? Charitable Charitable Foundation. It is only a charitable, a charity or charitable foundation by name only. That is the only thing you possess. And the whole M&A is just a normal limited company. You see, a company is meant for doing business, not as a charity or to hold funds for charitable purposes. If you want to set up a company, okay, a company limited by guarantee, okay. But not like this. So the name is charity, but in fact, it's just like any other, you know, uh, corporate vehicle for the purpose of business. Therefore, it has created all kinds of problems. It is, it is in early days, you know, because in the first case, in those days, uh, the, the kind of making charitable trust is still not popular. In particular, Mr. Wong is, is is known to be someone not prepared to spend a lot of legal fees. So therefore, he did not spend much on creating a trust. He can do something himself. So what he did was, he made a some kind of a trust by changing the name of the company into what he thinks is a charitable trust. When it is not. Anyway, this is all we need to know. And then, this is the translation. Okay, let's take a break now. <coughs>